yes, yes, y'all, but you don't stop, let's smurf it up, you see it's time to rock, yes, yes, y'all, but you don't quit, if you were looking for a party, this is it. Wake up, Smurfs, I think I found a cure, but to test it, you must catch a purple Smurf, it will be dangerous, are there any volunteers? Hey, everyone, it's your good pal, Purple Smurf 13, and I'm back with another thrilling episode of Under the Mushroom Cap. A special edition, it is The Mando Report. That's right, this is my exclusive review of episode number three, which I like to call I'm on a boat. Now we look at this. You know, before we look at the opening credits, look at this logo. I have a question. Do you know Star Wars is not a word? Star Wars is two words. So putting it together like this, it's become something else. But you know what? Looking at it, I've decided that Star Wars is not a word. But Star Warsy is now a word. You know, Star Warsy is when you do something and like they say, uh, you know, I have a bad feeling about this. You know, just because it feels Star Warsy to say that. Or, you know, they uh, before the Great Adventure, they have to sit around a, a table at a cantina and discuss whether the vehicle is up for the journey. And, and that feels Star Warsy. So Star Warsy is going to be like, it's kind of a uh, low-grade member berry. We're, we're not exactly referring specifically back to something from the past, but we're doing a very familiar action or a very familiar visual because it just feels, you know what I mean? It just feels Star Warsy. Star Wars. Star Wars. There you go. All right, let's get into the story. Now, we open on the Mandalorian taking a nap. You know, isn't this funny? He has taken so far four naps in three episodes. We haven't seen Moff Gideon. We haven't heard boo about the Darksaber, but we have seen him take four naps. I don't know about this pacing, guys. Ooh, next we see he's going to manually re-enter. Don't want to burn up into the atmosphere. It's going to be a bumpy ride. And we've gone from the nap DeLorean to the hanks as Ron Howard's daughter throws a big old member berry at Apollo 13. Now here's funny, the voice of the tower as the Razor Crest is plummeting towards the dock is literally the same voice that we have on modern phone trees. He goes, if you'd like to make a call, please dial one. If you'd like customer service, please stay on the line. <laughs> it's like when they played that Muzak version of the Imperial March in Solo. It's just sometimes these little clunkety things from our modern 21st century, 20th century lives they take you out of the story a little bit. You know, I don't need the actual voicemail lady. If you'd like to make a call, raise a crest. Please check your speed. But anyway, and that actually brings me to another question, and feel free to leave this in a comment, because I have questions about how to name a ship, okay? What are ship naming conventions? Please help me out here, you Star Warsy people. Star Wars. Star Wars. We know that Han Solo had the Millennium Falcon, and sometimes he would call it the Falcon. Uh, in the first episode, we actually heard Mando referred to his ship as the Crest. And I wondered about that. Is it the Crest? Is there only one Crest? I mean, was there only one Millennium Falcon? I would assume so. It was a Corellian YT freighter, but not every Corellian YT freighter is the Millennium Falcon. So the Crest would make it seem that, you know, the Space Winnebago is a standard model, at least it has been since, you know, uh, space balls. But his is called the Razor Crest. But what I don't get is, how come the space cops in the second episode, and now the voice of the tower... If you'd like to make a call... And they can just look at the ship and they go, Razor Crest, Razor Crest, you're missing a taillight. Razor Crest, your, your, your expiration sticker. Razor Crest, this is a back-in only parking space. If you'd like to make a call... So I just don't understand. Is a Razor Crest a kind of ship, or is a Razor Crest his ship? Just get it straight, okay? Thanks. Now here's... This was a cool one. I wouldn't even call this a member berry. This was a bit of meta lore where in Oakland, California, there was an urban legend the At-Ats were based on these cargo cranes. It turns out that's not true, but here the visual effects team, I think that was a pretty sweet thing to do. They kind of made a reference to the urban legend by making these harbor cranes with the bottom legs of the At-Ats. So, good on you. I like it. That's, that's a kind of little visual uh, nod for the fans that I think is kind of cool. A little bit of meta lore. All right, now we have Blue and Pink Frog are reunited. 
I mean, the blue was the boy, the pink was the girl. It's, it's a little on the nose. And I actually thought this scene would have worked a little better with the music from Love Actually, you know, from the airport scene. But hey, you can't have everything. Now, this is interesting. We see Baby Yoda. He looks at the two frogs. They stroke each other's face. They look at each other. And then they look down at the eggs. And the music swells. We see Baby Yoda having a moment of insight. In the previous episode, he's just gobbling the eggs like they're Whoppers on Easter morning, 1986. Just can't stop. Can eat the whole carton. But here, he's seeing something that he didn't realize. You know, there's the affection of the parents, the expectation when they look at the eggs. And, and it makes you think, going back to the critical plot points of episode one, this baby Yoda is a clone. He doesn't have a mother or father. So he doesn't understand what it means to be a, a mother or a father or what the signification of an egg is. He has this beautiful moment where he looks up at Mando. Mando also doesn't have a mother and father. So we see this insight moment when Baby Yoda is being treated like more than just a living MacGuffin or a prop. And good old Mando, worst dad ever, he goes, I see you're hungry. I'll get you something to eat. Thanks, Mando. Way to step on this moment of character development for Baby Yoda. All right. All of this was just a preamble to the episode. The action, the plot of the episode, we now can feel that it's gearing up. So I'm going to put up a little device, and we're going to use it to tally, to keep score. That way we can get a numerical value for this episode that's based on actual criteria, not just liked it, hated it, taped it. If you'd like to make a call. So you remember one of my biggest critiques was the amount of main story arc, Dark Saber, Moff Gideon, the mystery of why Baby Yoda was cloned, versus side quests and member berries. So I'm going to make this visual here. You see it? It's like ancient Egypt. It's like the scales of Osiris, you know, where when you died and you went to the next life, your heart was weighed against the feather, and every bad thing you did would make your heart heavier. But if your heart was light with good deeds and you balanced with the feather, then you would go on to the... Uh, the land of the blessed. So we're going to do something like that. We're going to evaluate the episode using the scales of Osiris, but to make it more Star Wars, Star Wars. let's replace Osiris with Jar Jar Binks. Perfect. Here we go. On this pan of the scale, we're going to put the heart. And the heart is the story, the main story, the arcs of each character towards the goal. So every time this episode moves us closer to the goal, in a way that feels meaningful and exciting, we're going to put a heart on that side. But... The feather is the fluff. That's just visual references, member berries, and side quests that make us feel something for a moment. Like, haha, I clapped because I saw it. But they don't feed us. They don't give us the nourishment that we want for the larger story arcs. Okay? So here we go. Ah, yes. What is he going to say to the blue frog? I was told you could lead me to others of my kind. Now, this is so funny because that is the quest arc of the season, so I could put a heart on the scale. But it's been said so many times already that it's its own kind of member berry. It's practically its own version of the Bernie Sanders meme. Once again, I am asking for your vote. All right. He's walking through the crowded harbor, and we see Braid Girl in a Sith robe, and the music gets dark. Ooh. We don't know who it is. We don't know it's Braid Girl, but that's going to matter later. Ah, uh, member berry, we're in a kind of a cantina, but this time it's a, you know, like a, a ship's tavern. And didn't they have some sort of slop like that in The Force Awakens where they just put slop in your bowl like that? We can call that a double member berry. And, oh, don't say it. Man, Mando, don't say it. Have you seen others that look like me? Oh. Once again, I'm asking for your vote. Another Bernie Sanders meme. Okay. Now we got Baby Yoda and he's eating soup. He's eating soup! Member Barry. And remember when he ate the frog? Oh, this time the octopus landed on his face. Oh. Now this was interesting. To get the octopus off of Baby Yoda's face, Din Djarin, worst dad ever, takes a knife and pokes at the octopus, which is attached to his son's face. That's not how you do it, Dad. That's not how you do it. It will be dangerous. Now, he's led to Squid Face, another Squid Face, who says, You seek others of your kind. Once again, I'm asking for your vote. And the quest begins. 
finally, we're on the way. We're on the boat. And listen to this. The Mando theme comes in as we're looking at the boat. Yeah, I gotta admit, I love it. That theme really fits the feeling of the boat traveling over the water. It's kind of a piratey theme. So, yeah, I love that. That was great. Now, here they are. They're going to feed the beast. I don't know. Kind of brought to mind a mashup of the Rancor from Return of the Jedi with the Wrath Tars from the Force Awakens, so I'm gonna have to member bury that one. And you know, it isn't a perfect duplicate of either of those scenes, but it's definitely Star Wars-y. Now the banter and the tension right before they kick Baby Yoda into the thing and lock Mando under the grate, I thought that was great. Excellent, great script writing, good banter, good tension. So that was a nice moment. Mando's under there, they're poking him with the spears, the real tension, I, this was nice, this was good. Then we get the blue crew, here comes the blue crew. They jetpack in to save Mando's butt. Now here's a little detail, remember we saw Braid Girl under the Sith robe? We didn't know who it was then, we won't know till she takes off her helmet. But these little structural pieces help the story to feel more believable because in retrospect we can recognize, oh she was the girl back then, that's how they jetpacked onto the boat. If we hadn't had that little moment with her in the middle and the jetpacks just appeared out of nowhere to save Mando's butt, it wouldn't be quite as uh, effective. So I give credit here. The little cameo of Braid Girl in the beginning made this scene pay off in a better way. Now here's another piece. It's either good or bad, depending on how you look at it. The Blue Crew actually talks with the same affect, jargon, and sort of rhythm as the Clone Wars Rebel animation continuity. They say these phrases a lot in the cartoons, and I'm not sure. They say phrases like, I'm on it, and copy that. I just think they say those a lot in the cartoons. I think it's just stuff that it's okay for kids to repeat or something. But as soon as the Blue Crew lands, we hear that, I'm on it. So, I don't know, either it's an inconsistency that they talk that way and the rest of the Star Wars universe doesn't, or it's a consistency that as you try to merge these two continuities, you're bringing pieces of each to the table. Like it? Didn't like it? I don't know. Just noticed it. You decide. Now they finally get to talk to each other, and this is kind of a controversial scene because it's like we're dealing with lore, and I use that sort of half-punningly, which goes back 20 to 30 years about who are the Mandalorians, what did they believe, when did this happen, when did this happen, who is the Death Watch, who is on the throne, who are the pacifists. These are big pieces of Mandalorian... These are big pieces of Mandalorian lore, Mandalorian lore, that are being moved around on the chessboard by this kind of idle chit-chat. But there is one thing that's consistent. As we have seen many times before, Din Djarin is the least, the least informed, informed person in the room about his own culture almost at any given moment. Maybe he needs a nap. bo says, you are a child of the Watch. Can we guess what Mando's answer? The Watch? Like, I've never heard of this thing. I've never heard of the very thing that I belong to. That's eh, pretty consistent. Finally, when they tell him what is going on, he says, no, it's not part of my plan. There's only one way, the way of the Mandalore. So now we're finding out that he belongs to some weird subset of religious zealots that wants to restore the ancient ways, and he's not open to other plans. He's a closed-minded member of a weird cult. That's good to know. Now, this was a little scene. It was very quick, but we saw a sunset, and we saw the jetpacks flying off, and then the fishing boat was blown up. It was kind of a NASA Cape Canaveral moment. I think that was another um, Bryce Dallas Howard kind of Apollo 13 member berry there. Wait a minute. So Mando was watching the jetpacks and the ship blow up from back on the dock, so that was a pretty short trip. You know how we heard the Mandalorian theme as the ship was leaving the harbor? I actually think that was real time. Because it looks like the boat didn't get very far. It was like, dun 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 Hey, you want to see us feed this monster? I mean, it's kind of silly that the boat didn't get very far. But hey, details. So here he is, he's walking, and then the squid face's brothers come in, you know. You killed our brother. I'm going to kill your pet. Mando doesn't get a chance to respond or fight to save Baby Yoda because the Blue Crew drops in again and saves his butt. This is becoming its own member berry. Can I buy you a drink, they say, and we're back in a cantina. 
And Din Djarin is sharing his views on things with bo -Katan. She knows everything. He has these weird, outdated ideas. He even says at one point that he believes there's a curse on his planet. What are the terms of the curse, Mando? Please spell it out. Anyone who goes there dies. Well, you know, Mando, that's actually true of all planets. Think about it. Then Bo-Katan gets into some contemporary talking points. She tells us that even if you're a backwater religious zealot, you know what? They're just wanting to divide us. And to be honest, Mando, we're stronger together. That's a bumper sticker they have. But he says, it's not my plan. I need to return the child to the Jedi. Now wait for this one. Tell me if you know where this setup is going to go. Bo-Katan says, what do you know of the Jedi? Anyone want to guess? Nothing. Yes, that's right, Din Djarin. You are once again the, the least, least informed, informed person, person in the, in room. the room. While this is going on, Braid Girl and Baby Yona have this weird moment. They both, the guests, like to consume living creatures. He looks at her. She slurps down a tentacle. She looks at him. He looks at her. They give each other a look. I'm not sure what it meant. But I don't know what you think. But let's get back to Braid Girl for a minute. Actress, you are great. I kind of wish your character had a name or maybe more than one line, but I got to take issue with the braids, okay? If you're a woman, if you're a man who's had long hair and you've ever had your hair in braids, there's a reason the braids fall in the back. This crossing of the two braids over the forehead, I mean, is it the thing that somewhere at a conference table in Lucasfilm, they'd be like, you know what would be really Star Wars-y? It's like, if like all women had like cool braids, because Leah had, like, buns, and Padme had, like, other buns, and Rey had, like, knots. So, like, women in Star Wars, they always have to have, like, cool braids. It's really Star Wars-y. I mean, if you're a Mandalorian and you've got these braids crossed on your forehead and you're putting on your helmet and you're in the middle of a battle, it could fall into your eyes, then you're reaching up the helmet, you can't lift them up. So whoever did the character design, I just think the braids were so unnecessary. It was Star Wars-y. In fact, it was the definition of Star Wars-y. There was no reason to do it other than it felt Star Wars-y, but it, it did nothing. So not a fault of you, actress. You were wonderful. But yeah, no, lose the braids. All right. Finally, we get to the... Oh, side quest. How is he going to find the Jedi? Bo-Katan says, you have, to fump, you have to help us find a thing so we can get the thing. Just a classic video game side quest. But Braid Girl did give a line. She got to talk about the schedule of when the freighter takes off. Then we got, oh, oh, this was a big member, Barry. We have the other guy say, these troopers can't hit the side of a bantha. Which is actually a double member, Barry, because the whole idea that stormtroopers can't shoot. And then that clone warriors or... Boba Fett-like characters have to have Aussie or New Zealand accents. I don't know why that is. I think it just felt Star Wars-y. Now we get this great scene of the worst dad ever. He's about to go on a dangerous mission. So he leaves his son with the Frog family. Leaves him in a town where everyone hates you. Leave him in a town where Squid Face's brothers have openly told you they want to kill your pet. And then leave him in a family where the eggs we know are Baby Yoda's favorite snack. Worst dad ever. But you know what? We did get this really cool moment where Baby Yoda was looking through the glass and he saw the tadpole come out of the egg. And it was just, that's the moment. That's developing Baby Yoda as a character. It ties into the other thing. He doesn't know who he is. He's a clone. He doesn't know what it means to have parents. He didn't know that things hatch from eggs. So that was a nice moment. You saw his cute face distorted in the glasses he's looking at. But we didn't hold it long enough. All of a sudden, we got hit with a swipe. Remember sideways swipes? Remember from 1977's A New Hope? Anyway, now we're on to the main action scene. <sighs> Imperial freighter takes off. Jetpacking mandos drop on. Boom, bop, swashbuckling action. Good stuff. Now, I like this. We cut to the control room, and, well, you know what? This looks a little bit like the at-at in the Hoth battle where you had the, the boss man and the two pilots, so I'm going to have to dock you a member, a member berry on that one. Sorry. 
But I do like this actor on the right. Look at the guy in the right-hand seat. He practiced, okay? He watched all the scenes of Imperial officers from Empire Strikes Back. He got the body language and the kind of confused obeying orders, even though you know it's a bad idea thing, perfectly. So kudos. He did some of the best acting in the show. Oh, look, Memberberry, stormtroopers are blasting in a hallway. Oh, look, Memberberry, I think this is a dialogue from New Hope when the stormtroopers say, Look over there, stop them. Now we have this scene where we've got them waiting as the elevator is coming and the tension, and they all have their blasters drawn. Member, like in Rogue One. In fact, this whole scene has this kind of recurring motif of the Keystone Troopers and Imperial officers just botching everything, letting them into the cargo thing, letting them suck out the cargo hatch, and we're enjoying it as TV watchers. And it's funny because they suck at being effective. But again, we like our villains to actually be scary sometimes, just a thought. Now here, the best acting in the episode was at 22 minutes and 20 seconds. Watch this guy. And watch the way we see his reaction all in the eyes. In fact, acting with the eyes is something I'm going to take a moment to talk about. Acting with the eyes, it's like how theater was done, how stage acting was done, how films were done. And I think from the prequel era onward, we've just seen the acting with the eyes kind of fall out of contemporary memory. If you watch the scene in Star Wars 1977, where Obi-Wan is talking about what happened to Luke's father, telling Luke about his father, and you watch his eyes. There's more acting in Alec Guinness's eyes alone than in all of... Insert sequel character that you dislike here. ...lines in the Disney sequel trilogy. It's incredible. And then it only amplifies it in the prequels when we know the context for the things he's saying. So acting with the eyes. It's something that actually is, dare I say it, Star Wars Z, but it's actually pretty much just good acting and good filmmaking, which Star Wars, by using actors like Alec Guinness, was tapping into that heritage. But anyway, let's look for that more, guys. Can we have more of that? Can we have more of the acting with the eyes? Especially you, Pedro. All right, let's wrap this up. We get some more cartoon dialogue from Bo-Katan. We copy, put some tea on for us. It's just that same kind of smart alecky, California, San Francisco, Bay Area teenager dialogue that the Filoni universe is steeped in. Again, is it consistent that she talks that way and other people don't? In a weird way, I guess it is. It is consistent. That's how that universe talks, and we're trying to merge continuities. So like it, don't like it, it is what it is. Then we have a nice callback. That's not the deal. You mean everyone is like leaning forward. Is she going to say, pray, I don't alter it any further? So that was almost like a Tantaberry where you hold out the member berry, but you don't give it. And instead she says, this is the way. Oh, that was another double member. Now, finally, we're in the control room. What do we see? Moff Gideon. Finally, he arrives on a Skype call. If you'd like to make a call. But. His badass nature is revealed. He says, long live the Empire. They're going to crash the plane, and our man, the commander, shoots the two goons. Okay? I felt that was very threatening. He shot them with so little mercy or regard, it upped the stakes and made the Empire seem like a threatening and frightening villain again. So let's have more of that, okay? And less keystone cops and funny because they're ineffective villains. Whoa, the ship is going down. Kind of reminds me of that Bugs Bunny, you know, the one with the air brakes. Oh, air brakes. Lucky for me, this thing had air brakes. Oh, remember berries. We're shooting stormtroopers in the hallways. Remember that? Remember that? Wait, wait. Remember that time when Han Solo didn't know what to do, so he just leaned forward with his shoulders, and he just went, ah, and he charged down the hall. Oh. Well, I gotta say one thing for Mando. It's a good thing that Beskar armor draws laser fire to it because it, you know, it'd be bad if the fire went to those two inch gaps between the plates, but it always hits right on the plates, which is great. Which is great. That's a little Beskar added feature for you. Now, finally, we get back to the main story. They bust into the front plot, and Bo Katan says to our AT driver, Where is the Darksaber? And phew! 
26 minutes and 39 seconds into the third episode of an eight-episode season, we got back to the main story. And then, where can I find the Jedi? Mando's on to his main story. Once again, I'm asking for your phone. And the funny thing is, when he asks, where can I find the Jedi? Bo-Katan's answer is literally like a video game. It's like an NPC in a video game. She says, you will go to the planet Corvus on the forest moon. There you will find Ahsoka Tano. I could see it like the old Pokemon in Game Boy. I could see it in a little rectangular box as she was talking. We're wrapping up the episode. Mando goes to pick up his kid, and we have another meaningful moment. Now, baby Yoda is taking care of the little tadpoles in a bowl of water, kind of being affectionate and caring for them. This is good. This is just what we want. We want to develop Baby Yoda into a real character with feelings and thoughts and a future. He's learning what it means not only to be cared for, but to also to care for others. This was a really nice scene. And then as they're getting out there, <laughs> Mando says as he wants to take one of the tadpoles, he says, I have enough pets. Good line. Okay? That was nice. I like a scene like that. A little witty remark. Very Star Wars-y. But in a good way. In a good way. Yeah. And as they're flying out, it looks like uh, he's got to pay the bill. I gave you a thousand credits. Is that the best you could do? And then he has to tap the little FedEx tablet to prove that he picked up the ship. And then Mando, as he's flying away, drops some low-key bigotry. Mon Calamari's unbelievable. As if he's heard his whole life what um, low-tech cheapskate people these are when they fix your ship. Yeah, I'm going to have to say nope on that. I mean, the high-tech ships that the Mon Calamari built in the original trilogy were sleek, futuristic, top of the line. So uh, we got a continuity glitch there. Not sure what to say about that. Mando, be better. Now, this last scene, I'm still kind of puzzling it out. An octopus creature is still in the ship. It climbs up, hovers over Baby Yoda. We see through the compound eye, and then he drops onto... Baby Yoda. I mean, I'm thinking this is a juvenile of the species that tried to eat him. And there I can kind of get this, the uh, symbolism. Like he was eaten by the big one, and now the little one is trying to eat him, but now he's big compared to the little one. I almost made sense to me, but I'm not sure what they were trying to do with this. Mando reaches out, crushes him with a hand, and then we actually see a scene that it looks like Mando threw him out the window. If you look, go back and look, you can see this small thing be tossed out of the razor crest as they're flying away. I don't know, I thought it was pressurized, what do I know? And then we cut back to him and he's slurping a tentacle, just like Braid Girl. Mando says, I finally know where I'm taking you. Again, the least informed person in the room. The show finally got back to the main story arc <laughs> the last four minutes of the third episode. And in just that same way, Mando says, I finally remembered there's a larger story arc besides side quests. But, you know, we're happy that it's finally there. And he says, I finally know where I'm taking you. It's going to be a bumpy ride. Which I think he said already at the beginning of the episode. So that's not quite long enough to be a callback. That's just, you're repeating yourself, dude. You're repeating yourself, dude think you need another nap. Well, that was it. On my chart that I'm keeping, I would say this bounces things back. This was a better episode than the previous one. In fact, this should have been the first episode. This should have been episode one. You could have merged in a few elements from the uh, Crate Dragon episode and the Ice Spider episode, get things going, and then go right to this harbor, you know? The scene where he's got Baby Yoda on the ship and they knock him in there. That was a pulse-pounding scene. That would have been a really exciting, you know, set piece for the season opener. And everyone loves jetpacks. So, in my opinion, we shouldn't have had those filler episodes one to two. Just start right here. And let's hope this is the beginning of getting back on track. Because, as much as this episode was an improvement, look at this. We've got three episodes clustering in the four, five, six range. Where in season one, we had the first three episodes clustering way at the top. So you're going to have to jump up the level of quality. Or we're just going to be stuck in filler land forever. Looking forward to episode four this weekend. I understand possibly it was directed by Carl Weathers. And who doesn't love Carl Weathers? All right, thanks, everyone. This was a long one, but I had a lot to say. And this concludes today's episode of The Mando, Mando Report. Report. 
And uh, be sure, since you've stuck with me this long, to check out this, the trailer from my new comic. You can get on the mailing list at Indiegogo, watch this trailer, sign up, and I'll see you next time under the mushroom cap. <laughs>